Would you turn in your Bibles to uh, John chapter 20? John chapter 20. And let's, let's talk about uh, what do you need to see in order to believe? Sometimes there are people that say, oh, you know, seeing is what? Believing. Believing. And so there are people that say, I, I just can't believe. I can't see it. I, I just don't get it. And so in John chapter 20, he talks about giving us the evidence. There have been people who saw it. And they're reporting it to us. And he's risen. He's alive. But sometimes we see things and we don't quite get it. You ever seen those 3D pictures? Here, here's one of them. Do you see anything there besides colors? You know, there's, there's something in that, that picture. Something that, that you have seen before. You see it? No, you don't see it? Raise your hand if you see anything there besides colors. You know, I have the hardest time with some of that stuff, but they tell me there's a bullseye right in the middle of it. Made up of the colors that, now if you look at it long enough, you know, I've, I'll forget if I wait to the end to tell you this. And, and I really wanted to, to tell the other two services at the end so we could come back to this idea. But there's a way to help you kind of see these things in the future. And, and they say if you take, you know, your, your fingers like this, and put them together, and just end on end. Hold them up in front of you so you can see it. Now focus on the screen. You know, look at the screen. Don't look at your fingers, but look at the screen in the distance. And then pull your hands, pull your hands just a little bit apart and see if you don't see a finger right in between. <laughs> so when you look at these things, now... I wanted to apply that at the end, but I ran out of time and got sidetracked from the last two services. Here's what I want you to get out of that. Instead of focusing on what's right here, look beyond to eternity. And when you look beyond, then you begin to see the splendor of what's going on right here. And you can kind of, you know, and with those pictures, if you look beyond them, then you can start to see What's in those pictures? But they tell me there's a bullseye here. You know what they tell me is on this picture? Besides what's in the lower right-hand corner over there. They kind of give it away, don't they? But they tell me there's a dog right in the middle. And I've seen it there. Or how about this picture? Do you know what's in here? Stars. Yeah, five of them. <laughs> no. That's what some of you are seeing at this point. No, there's an hourglass right in the middle, made up of that brownish kind of sandstone. And when you see it, the top part of the hourglass comes down to the middle and then back out so that the sand is falling down through there and you can see kind of four pedestals. Why am I showing you this? Because I want you to see there are, I want you to understand that even though you have eyes, you don't always perceive and see things like you need to. And so when I tell you that there's a God, there are literally people around the world that say, I don't get it. I can't see it. But if God's given you the eyes of faith, then just like there are some people that quickly pick up on those kind of pictures on the screen, there are people that have the eyes of faith. But in the Old Testament, in Jeremiah chapter 5, Verse 21, he says this, Hear this, you foolish and senseless people. You have eyes, but you, you don't see. There are people in the Lord just saying, I want you to get it. I want you to see what it's all about. And they just don't get it. Even though they have the eyes, they just don't get it. Or let me say it this way. Last week when we talked about it, it's, it's our responsibility to tell the people of the world so that we can open their eyes. Remember the text in Acts? so that their eyes would be open to see the light. We told you the reason that they can't always see is 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, where he says, The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. 
so that Jesus is the image of God. So when people saw Jesus, who did they see? He said it this way, he that hath seen me has seen the Father. That's why Jesus claimed to be God. He wasn't just God-like. He was God in the flesh. He that has seen me has seen the Father. And that's why he uses the word there in the image of God. And the icon of God, of God. Not an idol. An idol is something you worship that's not God. But Jesus is this wonderful image. The God became flesh and dwelt among us. But some people couldn't see it. Let me take you to most of John chapter 20. I want to see how well you see today. <laughs> this is the, in, not the entire chapter, but verses 1 through 29. And I'm going to highlight in yellow what the thrust of this passage is. When you open up the word of God, it's not like there are some things that you couldn't understand. God wants you to be able to understand them. He wants to be able, not, not everything is right there and readily and easily understood. But I want you to see that when you open up God's word, sometimes there's a, there's, let me say it this way, there's like a thread that starts and just weaves its way right through and it pulls that text together. And you can say, oh, I get it. This text is about, and then you begin to see what it's about. Let me take what I have in yellow there and put it in a larger print and you see what it's about. And what do you keep saying? He looked. He saw, he saw and believed. She looked and saw. She turned around and saw Jesus. I have seen the Lord. The disciples saw the Lord. We have seen the Lord. What do you think he's talking about in this text? It's not difficult, is it? It's, he's, I want to talk to you about seeing. Do you realize that there are some 11 Greek words for our word to see? And in this text, in, in John chapter 20, he uses different Greek words because he wants us to understand. But in English, they all got translated, saw, she saw, Peter saw, John saw. And every one of those words are different in the Greek text when it was first written. Now, we do that in English as well, but usually we use the word see. Oh, can you, do you see what I'm saying? And so we, we use that for everything. <gasps> I see it now. And so we use it for everything. But we have different words that we could use. We, we say to, you say to your kids, did you do your homework? And they say, oh, I, I glanced it over. What does that mean? <laughs> she said, nope. <laughs> no. I, did you do your homework? Nope. I, but I glanced it over. I, I put the book down. I turned the fan on there. And I watched the pages go. I, I, I glanced at that. We understand what it means to glance. If we say it's dark and it's night. And you're trying to appear. Peer into the darkness. That's another word. We, we you don't use it all the time. We say we looked at it. We glanced at it. We examined it. All of those different words meaning to see. Now for a moment, let's go back to the text. See what they say. John 20, verse 1. Early, on the first day of the week, which happens to be Sunday morning for them. The Sabbath for them, Saturday, Sunday morning. So early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple. Who's the other disciple? John. John wrote the gospel according to John. But he never refers to himself as John in the book. It's always the other disciple or the other disciple whom Jesus loved. You'll see it here several times. Leaves himself unnamed in the book. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple the one Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they put him. So Peter, and did I mention, and the other disciple, started for the tomb. Both were running. But the other disciple, I don't want to say it was me, he's saying. 
but the, both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter, reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, did I mention that? <laughs> Can you just say, you wonder what was going through his mind as he wrote this down. I did, I'm going to say that one more time. I, I beat him to the tomb. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. Look at verse 9. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. But we already know in this passage that they did, or at least one of them, believed already and understood the resurrection. But what is he saying here? They still didn't remember that they had read in Scripture that he was to rise from the dead. They knew it because they had seen the, the, the tomb was empty. They had seen the clothes folded. But they didn't remember from Scripture. Uh, Psalm 16, I will not let my Holy One see decay or corruption. Jesus' body never deteriorated like anybody else that's ever died. I'm not going to let my Holy One see decay, he said. But they didn't remember from Scripture but they had seen. He's gone. Look, we say seeing is what? Believing. believing. Or we say, I'll believe it when I, when I see it. We understand those things. I would say to you, the Lord invites us to take a good look at the empty tomb and conclude he is risen. He's alive. Now let me give you some people that are in this text that were there and saw and say, hey, I, I saw it. With my, I, I'll give you my eyewitness report. I saw it. First one is Mary Magdalene. And the word that's used in our text is the English word saw. I, she saw. Here's what she saw. Oh, before I tell you what she saw, what do we know about this woman? What do we know about Mary Magdalene? In Luke chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, here's what it says. After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. And it goes on, it was also there with him. So, here's this, here's this woman whose life had been completely transformed, set free. And it was because of her love for the Lord that she's the first, the first person to the tomb. And what happens? John 20, verse 1. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and what? Saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. The Greek word for that. Again, the Old Testament's in Hebrew, the New Testament's in Greek. So we go back and if you want to just kind of glean some more, you just say, what did it really, what was really used there? The Greek word that's used there is blepo, blepo. Most likely, we get our English word blip from that. Almost letter for letter. And it means, blepo means to just glance. To just glance at something. What is, uh, you ever watch these old movies when uh, the guys s sat in uh, an air traffic control tower and you, the radar's going around up above and you see this, this round screen and you see this sweep going around this screen and wherever there's a plane, you see a what on the screen? Just a, a blip for a second. Or maybe you've been in a, in a hospital and you're with somebody that has a heart monitor on them and, and you, you see something like this. 
and it's blip, blip, and it's going off. And just for what what does that blip indicate? A a moment in time, just a glance at what's going on in that guy's heart. That's the word that is used for Mary Magdalene. She gets to the tomb, she takes a glance, and then falls apart. You'd have thought she'd say, I need to find out what's going on here. Where are they? Think of, I don't know if you can even imagine what she must have felt like. I mean, if it's, if, it, if your son had died or your daughter had died or your spouse had died and, you, and they had buried, you'd been at the, at the grave and you watched the casket go down and a day or two later you come back and you see the grave is open and the casket's gone. What kind of turmoil is going to go in your heart if your son or your daughter has been stolen. I mean, it's bad enough that you had to cope with the death. Now it's not just the death, but somebody came and stole their body. Why? Well, they, they, were, they were grave robbers back in Jesus' day. I, I forget how many times Abraham Lincoln's body has been dug up. I think it was like 17 times. Because so many people had tried to rob it. There was one group that wanted to rob it and take it for ransom. Because there's a million people currently who go to his grave to view it every, every year. A million people. And he died in 1864, 65. A million people still going there? I can't imagine it. Now I forget how many feet down. I mean, they buried him like 10 feet deep and a ton of stuff on top of it so that he could never come up again. And, but back in those days, she thought the body had been stolen. What kind of look did she get? Just a what? Just a glance. Just a blip. Just a blip on the screen. Just a glance. And what did it leave her doing? Look at John chapter 20, verse 11. Mary stood outside the tomb. What was she doing? crying let me ask you this if she had really understood that he's alive would she be crying no she said hey fantastic he said he was gonna come back to life he's not here I need to go find him this is terrific instead just a glance sent her into tears I want to say to you today there are some of you that have just given Christ nothing but a glance. That's it. And you say, well, it didn't help me. You're just right where Mary was. You're not even giving any time to get to know him. That's just a glance. And he's saying, I want to spend time with you. He wants to see you. He wants you to see him, to know him. If you look at him at more than just a glance, you won't be left like this, all in tears. Look, the Lord wants us to look inside this empty tomb. Here are the people. Mary, just a glance. Peter, what was going on in his life? Same English word. He looked in and what? Saw. Mary saw, Peter saw it. Let's look at where he is in verses 6, 7, and 8. Then Simon Peter, who was behind, the one that got there first, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Doesn't this sound just like a man looking at all the details? Not these kind of details. When's the last time, you know, if you read about a wedding, what you, the woman and she had, and I'm reading the dresses they had on, I don't even know what the words mean that they're saying. And it was a, a camisole of this and a this to that. And, and I'm going, a what? She had a white dress on. Yeah. 
Yeah, bouquet of flowers. <laughs> and she threw the flowers away. I mean, that's, you know, that's, when a guy writes about something, is it details like this, usually? No, but he went in and he looked. Because when he went in and looked, look, he saw the strips of linen lying there. Same English word as Mary's, but not the same Greek word. What was the Greek word for Mary? Blepo. Blepo. Just a blip. Just a glance. The Greek word here is threo. Looks like this. Let me just give you the English word. Uh, we, uh, blepo. We, uh, I said, you know, there, I didn't know and I didn't find any place that the word blip had actually come from blepo. Except that many times you, you can see what's going on. In this one, you'll see the, the word we get in English exactly from this. The theta in the Greek letter, that first Greek letter, theta, is our letter TH. The epsilon is our letter E. The omega, well, this is the last letter in the Greek alphabet. I'm the alpha and omega. Looks like the W there. It, omega is our O. The next le letter in Greek is the rho, and it's our letter R, and then we add this to it. Or we write this way. Letter for letter, right out of the Greek. So what's going on here with Peter? Mary Magdalene comes in, takes a glance, falls apart, starts crying. Oh, what am I going to do? Peter goes in. Okay, I'm a detective. <laughs> what happened here? Let me see. Well, the linen's there. Oh, and the, it's all folded up over here. He's going to make a theory. Uh, what happened to the Lord? I want to say to you, there are some people that that's all that Christianity is to them. Something to investigate. Just some kind of a theory. And they want to know what it is in relationship to Islam or Buddhism or some other faith. You know, let me tell you this. You need to understand that we celebrate the resurrection today. This, this annually reminds us of Christ's death and his burial, but his resurrection. Why is his resurrection important? Let me tell you why the resurrection of Christ is important. Jesus said, you destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. I'll come back to life. If that never happened then I can't believe anything else that Jesus said. If he tells me he's got the power to come back to life and he can't, then if he tells me he's got the power to forgive sins, he can't do that either. But if he can do the impossible and raise the dead, then I can trust him when he says anything else. Because nobody else. Buddha, when he taught and died, he stayed dead. Muhammad, when he taught, died, he stayed dead. Confucius, when he taught, he died, he stayed dead. Any other world religion, the guy that taught it is dead. But Christ is alive. And he was seen on 10 different occasions, sometimes with, with more than 500 people that were there. And they go, wow, we've seen the Lord. And he says in 1 Corinthians, when he talks about those 500 people, he says some of them are still alive today when he had written 1 Corinthians. He said, so ask them. They were there. You know something, if I wrote a book today about uh, President Clinton or uh, President Bush or even uh, President Reagan, there are people today, alive today, that know exactly if I said, I wrote a book and I said, you know, I was, I was President Reagan's, one of his closest advisors. Do you think that book would sell? Do you think people would believe that, you know, I was there at the White House and all, giving him all that counsel? The people who were alive today that knew him and were alive with him, they'd say, Madison? Who? Where? Where does he live? Never heard of him. Paul said, 500 people saw Jesus and he's alive today. They're still alive today. Ask them. He said, I'm writing it. Ask them. But if he isn't true on this, then he's not true on anything else. So the resurrection is the cornerstone of our faith. 
And it's your hope that when you die, you'll live again with him in heaven. Let's go back here. It's a theory. And what's a theory? To carefully watch or examine. So how do you make theories? You pull everything apart and you say, okay, here's my theory. And by the way, can I just tell you, a theory is something that you're wanting to set up so that you can do it again and again and again and see if you have the same results. If you have the same results every single time, then it moves from a theory to a law. Let's say I, uh, I take this, this microphone and I hold it up here and I let it go. What's going to happen to it? Because of the theory of gravity or what? The law of gravity. Because the law of gravity says every single time that I do this, what's going to happen? Because it's, it's repeatable and every single time I do it, the same thing will happen. It's not going to levitate there. <laughs> Unless I do some magic or something. I wish I could do that right now and let go of it and have it. <laughs> you guys will go. <laughs> but if it's repeatable, you can do it. But that's why we call it the theory of evolution. It's never been called a law because it's not repeatable. It's just a theory. God comes along and he says, look, some of you are just looking at this, pulling it apart, making a theory out of it. Secret Service agent is a good example of somebody who carefully examines and watches things. When the president comes into a room, before he comes into the room, well, they sweep the whole area. Presidents often in, uh, in uh, Beverly Hills and so our, our kids are both with the department down there, and so we get a chance, you know, when the president comes into town or the, the, the first lady, Michelle Obama, comes into town, uh, our son is usually involved in some of that, and, and uh, so he gets to, to hang with the Secret Service agents. We uh, had uh, a couple of Secret Service agents that became our, our best friends over the years. I've... Uh, performed their wedding ceremonies. They, they have hung with different presidents and they'll say, you know, when we were with so-and-so, and they'll talk about, because they, they're, they're with them all the time. But you know, when they're out guarding the president, out in public, are they high-fiving people and saying, hey, good to see you, man. Good. Hey, how you doing today? Hey, well, good to see you. you know, are, they, are they paying attention to what's going on? And when you see this guy's picture, um, the sunglasses. Why the sunglasses? Because they don't want you to know where their eyes are going. If you really suspected somebody of going after the president, are you going to look at him like this? <laughs> he's going to say, he's looking at me. You know, you, you might you know, be looking over here. You, your head's over here, but your eyes are down here looking on his hands but you got the sunglasses on so that they can't see where your eyes are because you don't want to give away that you really are suspicious of what's going on with them, but you're examining it. It's not bad to examine things about the Word and the Lord, but it has to go beyond there, folks. Peter wasn't convinced of much of anything at this point. He saw, but he didn't believe yet. Let's go on one more. Let's look into this empty tomb. And, and Mary, she took a glance at it. Bleppo. Uh, Peter, he goes in and threo. He makes a theory out of it. Not, didn't change his life. Third person on the scene, John. He saw and believed. Look at what the text says. John chapter 20, verse 8. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and what? Believed. Let me say it this way. What he saw ended in belief. And there's a different Greek word that's used here now. But same English word, right? Saw. Mary saw, Peter saw, John saw. But they all ended up with a different conclusion. Because one just took a glance. One made a theory out of it. The other, 
Here's the Greek word that's used in this one. Aden. Aden. Let me give you the English word that's used for this. I'll start out this way. I'll give you a hint that the first thing we do is we drop the letter E off of it. Now, do you see the English word? What do you think the English word's going to be? The iota becomes our I. The delta becomes our D. The epsilon becomes our E. The nu, the Greek nu, becomes our N. And then we add this to it. And we're able to identify. John goes, it's the Lord! Fantastic! He saw and what? Believed. His life was different. He wasn't just making a theory out of it. He didn't make a glance and fall apart. He saw and believed. He wanted others to know. He got excited about it. I would want you to be able to identify the Lord. John became the first disciple to believe in the resurrection. Let me go back here. Mary took a glance. Peter examined it. John said, I, 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 can, I can ID him. There's the identity. He's God. He, it's the Christ. He was on the cross. When had John last seen the Lord? At the cross. You remember the other disciples had fled. But where was John? He was at the cross. He saw the spear in the side. He saw what was going on. He heard Jesus say, Woman, this guy's going to take care of you. He was assigned Jesus' mother. So when he got there, he could ID him and say, Ah, this is, uh, he, this is the Lord. He's alive. The disciples are the next uh, set of people that saw as well. They saw and not only believed, but when they saw, they were rejoicing. They, they were overjoyed about it. Verse 20 of chapter 20. After Jesus appeared to them on Sunday night, Sunday morning was the resurrection. So all day long, they didn't know where he was. Sunday night, 10 of the disciples are in a room together for fear of the Jews. Judas, of course, wasn't there. He'd already hung himself. Thomas wasn't there. We know that from this text. That's why he ended up doubting. He didn't, didn't see the Lord. The text says, after Jesus appeared to them, after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Same Greek root word is used here that was used for John. They said, wow. But look at the difference. Mary just took a glance and she ended up crying. John, wow, I can, I, he ID'd him and said, oh, this is the Lord. And he ended up in joy. What did the disciples end up doing? They were overjoyed. Wow, this is the Lord. Isn't, that, isn't this great? Wow, this is amazing. If they kill us, we're going to come back to life too. This is great. Let's go on, he says. Let me give you one other person. Because we have these wonderful people not always concluding the right things. Let me ask you this. Which one describes you? Are you like Mary, just giving the Lord a glance? Are you like Peter? Got to make it all about theory. Got to be able to know everything about it, but it hasn't changed your life. Because it hasn't gotten from, you know, the, the, your head down into your heart. You know it all. But God's word says knowledge does what to us? Do you know what it says? Knowledge puffs up. We get arrogant. And we think other people are stupid. Because we know. The purpose for knowing is so our lives can be changed. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you what? Free. The purpose for knowing is so we can be free from that sin that keeps pulling us down. John saw and believed. The disciples saw and rejoiced. Any of those 
reflect your life? Maybe this last person reflects your life. He wasn't there when the other disciples saw the Lord. And it's Thomas. And Thomas said, unless I see, I won't believe. I got to see it. Seeing is believing. Here's what it says in the text, verse 24. Now Thomas called Didymus. Can I tell you that name Didymus means twin? I don't know if he was a twin, but I know he has a lot of twins running around here today. Because Thomas did what? Doubted. Doubting Thomas. And maybe you're his twin. And maybe you're saying, ah, unless I see, I won't believe. And the Lord says, I'm showing it to you. It's like that 3D picture. And Satan wants to keep blinding your eyes so you can't see. You can't comprehend it. He says, I want you to see. There is a God. And he wants to live in you. And he wants to change your life. And he wants to give you hope. And he wants to give you a life that has meaning and purpose. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. I won't believe Let me say it this way. It is not important that you see that you see Jesus. Let me put it on the screen so you can just read it. It's not necessary to see Jesus in order to be saved. Yes, it was a blessing for the early Christians to see their Lord and to know what he, that he was alive. But that is not what saved them. They were saved not by seeing, but by believing. For by grace are you saved through, for by faith are you saved through grace, and that not of yourselves, it is the what? Yeah. Gift of God. For by grace are you saved through what? Faith. So it's your faith, your believing that reaches out. Not by seeing, it's by faith. That's why Hebrews 11 says, you know, faith is, is believing something we haven't seen. If I've seen it, I, I don't need faith. I've seen it. It takes faith to believe something you haven't seen. That's why Jesus said this to Thomas in verse 29. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Who's he talking about there? He's talking about us. We, haven't, we weren't at the tomb. We haven't seen Jesus face to face. Blessed are those, even though we haven't seen, believe. So when I look at this, I say, which one of these represents or describes your life today? Is it Mary? You're just glancing at the Lord? Is it Peter? And it's just, it's just a book to you. It's an old history book, and so you open the Bible and you read it. It's just, it's just some history. Is it John? Is it Thomas? Let me wrap it up this way. For you, for me, to live, something has to die. If you're going to eat lunch this afternoon, and I don't care if you're a vegetarian, you know, that lettuce has to die too. <laughs> if you don't believe it, just leave it set out. You know? <laughs> You'll smell just what anything else that dies ends up smelling like. It's living, it's growing. You pick it, it dies. You eat it because it gives you what? Life. For you to live, something has to do what? die. If you're going to, if you're going to enjoy that steak this afternoon, what had to die? That steer, the cow, something had to die. That's a physical law. 
For me to physically live, something is to physically die. For me to live eternally, someone had to die for my sin. That was Jesus. The wages of sin is death. I deserve to die. But God's word says in Romans 5, 8, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Just before it says that, though, it says God proved his love for us. How? While we were yet sinners, Christ did what for us? He died for us. Let me give you a picture of that. Uh, last November, I was watching uh, a portion of the Today program, and I thought, ah, that's exactly what I want them to see next Easter Sunday, next Resurrection Sunday. And here's the story. Guy came very, very ill. He put on 30 pounds in a month. He was tired all the time. It was his heart. His liver was putting out proteins and stuff that was damaging his heart. He was going to die. And he needed a transplant. But here, you listen to the story. The man who was given the gift of life. In a moment, Kirk Watson, who received a rare triple organ transplant, will meet his donor's family for the first time. But first, his story. In the summer of 2002, Colorado Sheriff Kirk Watson knew something was wrong. I gained 30 pounds in one month. And I had felt exhausted, like I'd just finished the marathon. It was a grim diagnosis, familial amyloidosis, a disease where the liver creates too much of a certain protein that then affects the heart and kidneys. First cardiologist I talked to said, a virus attacked your heart, you need a transplant, but don't expect one. Kirk was eventually put on the organ donor list for heart, liver, and kidney. The long wait for a new life began. Miles away, Lance Lingas was on a family outing with his wife and three children. Doctors believe it was a stroke that caused the 39-year-old to fall off his four-wheeler. I could see something was going on up front and all of a sudden there was an accident. Hours later, Lance was pronounced brain dead and his wife knew exactly what she needed to do. He, he always told me he wanted to be a donor. It was on his driver's license. He was very strong, so his organs were good. I really wanted to follow through with his wishes. And quickly one family's tragedy was another family's miracle. I remember when I woke up from surgery, I could feel the difference in the heart. I mean, it was like pounding strong. and I could feel it through my legs, the pulse. So we got this letter from the donor's family. My wife and I just sat there and cried. My name is Jessica and I am Lance's spouse of 16 years. Lance was always a very giving person who never took rest. He enjoyed helping others, working hard, and making memories with his family. This person gave the last gift to me that he could. And it saved my life. When I look now at all he did and has done and is continuing to do, well, this is Lance. He doesn't take rest. He has now given more life. Kirk Watson is here now with his wife, Rita. Good morning to you both. Good morning. Good morning. Just watching that had, had you in tears, Rita. <laughs> yeah. How grateful are you to this man, Lance? Oh, I'm very grateful. I mean, he changed my life. I'm very saddened that his life gave me life. Catch that last phrase? His life gave me life. I want you to know that Jesus died on the cross. He gave his life. You deserve to be on that cross. And yet he says, I'll give my life for you so that you could have eternal life. But today you have to say, I, I, Lord, I want to trust you. The question I have for you is uh, this. Can you believe without seeing? 
Or are you like Thomas? Unless I see, I won't believe. Or can you, with the eyes of faith, say, Lord, history lays it all out there. It just, Lord, you, you left evidence. And I see it in a changed life here, and a changed life here, and a changed life here, because my life changed when I asked Jesus to come into my life, when I repented of my sins and said, Lord, I want you to be my Savior. My life changed. I'm wanting to say to you, what did he say when he got up off the operating table and he started to walk? What could he feel? The strength of that what? That heart, that new heart, pounding. I could feel it in my legs. It was a difference. I want you to understand, if you repent of your sins, you say, Lord, I, I have been a sinner. You don't even want to f debate that, do you? You know you're a sinner, don't you? You know that you're selfish at times. You know that you lust at times. You know that you covet at times. You know that you're not on the right track. And he says, look, if you repent of your sins and trust Christ as your Savior, your life's going to change. But it'll be a good thing, just like it was for him. There'll be a new power inside you to live the way you ought to live. A new hope inside you. A new peace inside you. A new joy inside you. And it just goes on and on. But someone is saying to me today, but I... Just like I, you, I couldn't see those pictures, uh, that dog in there, that hourglass in there, that, that bullseye, I couldn't see any of those. I still can't see the Lord. And I'm praying for you today that God would just take the veils from your eyes, let you understand that there is a God and He loves you so much that He let His Son his only son. Leave heaven, come down, be born, and die for you. And then resurrect it so you can live again, so you can come down and live in you. And to be the kind of person that you really want to be, but can't without his power. Don't you want to be one of the greatest dads, one of the greatest moms? Don't you want to be a godly son or a godly daughter? Don't you want to be somebody that has joy and peace and gentleness? And or, or are you really happy with just being selfish at times and having those lustful thoughts at times and getting angry at times? Is that what you want? Lord said, if you'll turn your life to him, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. That's what the Lord wants to do in your life, in the lives of others. Let's pray together, shall we? Heavenly Father, would you take us in these moments and speak to our hearts with the power of your Spirit? While your heads are bowed, while God is dealing with your heart, with your mind, with your life, can you say to him today, Lord, I, I do sin. I have been selfish. I know what it's like to, to be selfish. I know what it's like to get angry. I know what it's like to lust. I know what it's like to name the sin. Tell him what it is. And then can you say, but Lord Jesus, I thank you that you love me enough to die on the cross for me. Lord Jesus, you're alive today and I invite you to come and live in my life. Make me what you want me to be. I want that joy. I want that peace. I want that gentleness. I want the power to live like you want me to live. For 
For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.